Greetings everyone. Welcome to the ongoing series on inequality and difference. In today's lecture, I shall be talking about a very interesting topic and that is Ganikas in early India, some dimensions. This lecture will exemplify how gender identities constitute one of the most prevalent forms of inequalities which were most fervently enforced and reinforced in both the public and the private domain. There exist several forms of bondage like slavery, like prostitution and ganikas in ancient India and slavery in medieval India fall in this category. The development and explorations of women's history was witnessed in the 1970s with an attempt to make women visible by identifying new sources and also reinterpreting already existing sources. So, it is in this context that one can review the literature that has been handed down to us and try to locate the position of the marginalized women in society like the Ganikas. Ganika still has not been given adequate exposure in the works on socio-cultural history and gender relations as the cultured woman of the town, the courtesans provide an interesting topic of study. In the lecture, I would be examining the changing views about the institution of the Ganikas with the passage of time, placing it in a larger socio-cultural framework in order to look at the various environments and conditions that facilitated the increasing contempt for the institution in early Indian society. Also an attempt will be made to analyze the household of the Ganikas as compared to the common and the royal household in terms of the status of women, gender roles, socio-economic independence of women members etc. Now, if we talk about the institution of prostitution in early India, a general trend when referring to Ganikas was that there was no differentiation between the Ganikas who were highly accomplished courtesans and common prostitutes and this kind of uh, uh, you know writing uh, was not only visible in contemporary sources, but even in present times the historians kind of uh, refer to them in passing reference. So, an attempt is now being made to understand the various structures of the tradition of the Ganikas as depicted in early Indian texts and art remains and identify the differences and hierarchy that existed within the tradition which would also highlight the issue of gender. So, as one talks about such topics then what actually are we achieving? We are trying to develop an understanding about genderization of early India. So, the lecture uses the methodology of gender history to study the tradition of the Ganikas. Literary and art sources can be used to understand this institution in a better perspective. Several Sanskrit and Pali texts which could be divided into different genres like Natya, Katha and Shastra and some secondary sources can also be utilized to understand the tradition of the Ganikas. Then uh, one also needs to highlight the fact that Ganika was not something which was unique to Indian culture or society there were several contemporaries of the Ganika tradition 
For example, the hetaira, literally meaning female companion in Greek, was one of a class of professional independent courtesans in ancient Greece. Then there was the geisha of Japan who originated in the pleasure quarters, palaces and were defined as the entertainers or the artists. Then there were some other analogous female portrayals also. For example, the Rupa Jiva who were sex workers with beauty but without any talents. Then there was the institution of Devadasi often defined as the temple dancer or the woman dedicated to temple or servants of God and such uh, uh, performing such duties. So, if we consider the word etymologically, the English term courtesan like the French courtesan derives from the feminine form of the Italian word cortigiano. Strictly defined, it means a woman who frequents a court and who like a courtier is well dressed, well mannered and skilled in diplomatic uh, efforts. So, the ganika or the court courtesan was the most prominent female personality of the urban centers as represented in the early Indian literature. Ganika is derived from the term gana to which the feminine suffix ika was added. The meaning for gana ranges from group or a troop etc to signify company, association or corporation. As has been pointed out by Romila Thapar, the Ganikas can be considered as women who were not required to maintain or observe the boundaries of caste hierarchy and as women who could deny the centrality of procreation. Also, they were not uh, expected to observe monogamy and had an independent source of income and they could oppose patriarchy as she was well connected to the royal court as well as the urban rich. So, clearly we see that Ganika was someone who was part of the elite culture. Uh, she was the cultural woman or rather the keeper of culture of the urban society and the association of the tradition of the Ganikas with several artistic art forms uh, was a continuous process which further uh, kind of uh, created a special identity for her persona. The tradition that evolved in the urban society uh, mainly in the cities of early India clearly represented flourishing of elite culture. However, uh, one must understand the ambivalences and the ambivalent attitude that was prevalent towards Ganikas. The institution of the Ganikas stood in contrast to the patriarchal norms and so it made her uh, or it pro projected her as a woman who was criticized severely and also feared constantly while also admired her beauty and skills uh, made them a woman of desire. So, this ambivalent attitude further uh, kind of developed around this category of women in early India as the material milieu uh, expanded as more urban centers emerged and as the elite culture further prevailed. So, the Ganikas occupy a unique place in the whole range of Sanskrit literature, highlighting the social and cultural climate of the period. But in most of the studies, their contribution to socio cultural life is rather underestimated. When we are talking about the changing material milieu, then we must point out various changes that were occurring in early India during different historical periods and the second urbanization was one of the phases that began 
in the middle Gangetic plains by 1st millennium BCE onwards. Besides other impacts out of the transition, what was now appearing more clearly was the shifting of values, emergence of new cultural traits uh, and greater incentive with the growth of urbanization as well as social complexities and a whole new material life was emerging because of all these changes. The tradition of the Ganikas was one of the institutions that evolved into significance with the growing and expanding urbanization process and it also represented the socio-cultural uh, milieu of the period especially up to Gupta era. The tradition continued after the decay or transition of the urban centers also during the post Gupta period onwards and continued well up to 1200 CE. Now these were the centuries which underwent considerable socio-economic cultural changes and the institution of Ganikas continued to evolve during these different historical phases. So the socio-economic phases were associated uh, clearly with the changing role of the Ganikas. As has been pointed out by Romila Thapar in one of her works, the past as present, forging contemporary identities through history. The profession of the prostitutes and Ganikas and the link between the Ganikas and the later institution of the Devadasis is a very interesting topic of study. Several studies were also conducted in the past and there was some kind of discussion uh, about this institution. For example, uh, S.N. Sinha and N.K. Basu's History of Prostitution in India dealt with the study of prostitution chronologically from the Vedic period to the age of Vatsyayan, looking at the causes as well as relation with the wider aspects of socio-cultural life. Then there was A. S. Altekar in his Position of Women in Hindu Civilization who described the Ganikas as the custodians of fine arts which had ceased to be cultivated elsewhere in society. However, no in-depth analysis or a gendered analysis of this particular category was undertaken. An exclusive study on Ganikas was conducted by Ludwig Sternbach in his work Text on Curtisans in Classical Sanskrit. This was a collection of maxims, aphorisms and quotations from several classical Sanskrit literature, uh, literary sources on Ganika tradition. And it highlighted their general characteristics, obligations, uh, duties in the household as well as aspects of love. Uh, another very important text that kind of mentioned uh, this institution was the Earth Shastra, which claimed that the property and the portion of Ganika's earnings were the property of the state. And as has been pointed out by Suvira Jaiswal, the institutionalized position of the higher class of prostitutes and also the legal status enjoyed by them clearly uh, emerges as something unique and different. As has been uh, pointed out by Shalini Shah in her work, Love, Eroticism and Female Sexuality in Classical Sanskrit Literature. In this work, there has been an attempt to study the institution and its different categories in the context of patriarchal dominance. So the work has examined the aspect of matriarchy instead of patriarchy, then the several strategies that were devised and the ideals that contradicted the values of patriarchy. Shalini Shah has also examined 
the socio sexual norms of the vesa vasa household of the sex workers and the antah pura of the patriarchal patriarchically regulated domestic space uh, as it has appeared in the sanskrit literature of contemporary times the author while examining the sex workers and the ganika however uh, has not really differentiated between the two and looks at both the traditions under one single category then another scholar kavita gaur has enquired into the distinctive roles of the wives and courtesans in the kam sutra and have reexamined the conventional notion of the dichotomy that was portrayed in the text another very interesting work has been done by kumkum roy uh, in the article representing the courtesanal tradition looks into the tradition through different genres of literature and has located the institution of ganikas in the economic sphere and also has uh, explained the socio emerging socio political context uh, then monica saxena also has described ganika as a public woman and has explored the ironies and paradoxes that existed in the perception regarding the class of ganika as compared to the ordinary prostitute serenity young has used buddhist literary sources for examining the category of ganikas uh, and uh, some jataka stories have also been referred uh, and uh, as a result uh, uh, there has been a discussion on ganikas like amba pali and mani mekhalai so basically covering both the northern as well as the southern india in the discussion on the subject then we have works by shonalika kol who has studied urban society of early india in the kavyas of the sanskrit literary tradition in her work imagining the urban sanskrit and the city in early india uh, she has observed the location of the ganika quarters in the cities and represents her as one of the professional characters that exemplify urbanism so ganika was not merely uh, a figure or a person to be uh, uh, associated with by the elites rather she signified the whole tendency the whole idea of an urban center then uh, there are works by vidya dehejia uh, and one of her work representing the body gender issues in indian art is a compilation of works dealing with the issues such as spectatorship and representation of the female figure and the construction of femininity which can be seen in most of the sculptures of the contemporary period Uh, and in her work the body adorned vidya dehejia has referred to the topic of ganika while dealing with the idealized female body uh, and ornaments in the indian sculpture devangana desai's work erotic sculpture of india a socio cultural study makes a preliminary attempt to study the subject in greater detail so devangana desai has pointed out the representations of ganikas in the art of early india and on this basis she tries to understand the socio cultural milieu in which the ganika tradition flourished seema baba uh, in her study on gender and art and one of her works gods men and women gender and sexuality in early indian art has documented the sculptural evidence of the ganika representations in early art then uh, one has to mention the special status that was associated with the figure of ganika 
So, Ganika was not a common prostitute. She was not to be associated only with flesh trade. Their status was similar to a hetaira of ancient Greece who served the selected few and also was different from uh, the ordinary uh, public women who kind of served a large number of clients. They provided companionship as well as intellectual stimulation. So, there was definitely a difference between a ganika versus a prostitute and this difference is also mentioned in the commentaries of Medha Tithi uh, which mentioned that a ganika was superior to a prostitute. Vatsyayan in Kama Sutra has given a detailed reference to the functions that were to be performed by well accomplished women and he has spoken of 64 arts. A public woman endowed with beauty and 64 kalas was to be respected by royalty as well as by respectable men. So, she was an object of universal regard and Ganika's social status can be described as a privileged one though an ambivalent one also. Here we can give example of Jivika, Jivaka who was the famous physician uh, and he was the son of a Ganika named Salavati and he was referred to as Ganika Putra. Then during Gupta period, uh, Ganikas they used to display their own Dvajas. So, that was the kind of independence and identity that they enjoyed. They could choose whom to consort and charged as much as 500 gold coins. However, the ambivalences were there to remain. Uh, they were much sought uh, after for their talent, but they were also looked down upon because of their profession. And in the play Mritcha Kattikam, uh, finally uh, the marriage of Ganika Vasant Sena with Charu Datta was the uh, as only a wife could be socially acceptable and not a courtesan clearly highlights this kind of dichotomy that existed in society. Thank you.